Hello and welcome to the episode number three of the Indology A podcast. Colonialism wasn't just about taking over land or resources; it was also about making the people who were taken over feel small and less important, so that they would be weakened and not feel encouraged to put up a resistance or any sort of a mutiny against the colonial forces. And for this, the colonizers use history as a powerful tool. to keep control over the people who they had conquered they rewrote history to make themselves look better and to make the conquered people seem less important this made the conquered people feel like they weren't as good or smart enough this made them doubt themselves and feel like their culture wasn't valuable that their heroes weren't heroes but villains that their history that was passed on to them by their ancestors perhaps wasn't true Even today the effect of this twisted history can be felt it affects the way our society is organized how our people see themselves and whether they fight to take back their culture through the rewriting and imposition of history the colonizers for instance the british sought to propagate a narrative that cemented their superiority while casting the colonized in our case the hindus as inferior and subservient the great historian and indic thought leader sri sitaram goel wrote about this in great detail in one of his passages he says this version of indian history was formulated by a few misinformed or motivated british historians in due course this became the standard lore taught in our schools and colleges under the system of education sponsored by christian missionaries and british bureaucrats the same system of education has not only continued after independence but has also multiplied many fold it has spread this version of indian history to larger and larger segments of succeeding generations muslim and marxist historians have promoted it with an ever increasing zeal they may not have any use for hindu spirituality but they find this version of indian history very convenient for advancing their imperialist causes in the process india's history has become a history of foreign invaders aryans and iranians and greeks parthians scythians kushans arabs turks persians portuguese dutch french and the british rather than a history of the greatest civilization which the world has known and later on a history of hindu heroism which fought and ultimately frustrated all foreign invaders akbar is one character who has received a fantastic marxist makeover the eminent historians have glorified him the bollywood charlatans have romanticized him and the opportune politicians have sanctified him but what is his reality speaking from a purely historical point of view who was akbar really well rather than giving you my opinion on akbar or telling you what to think i will tell you a story instead the story of akbar's attack on the fort of chitor this story of akbar's attack on the fort of chitor has been described by manucci who was a venetian traveler and a writer who had been in india during mughal times this incident has also been mentioned by the portuguese writer faria manucci says the first thing akbar did was to surround the fortress called chitor This fortress was on a hill of no very great height but its sides are quite smooth like walls it lies in the middle of a wide open plain in this fortress are fine springs of sweet water and during a time of siege enough supplies are collected to support the people inside it cannot be taken by force of arms before akbar came to invade this fortress he dispatched an ambassador to the raja directing him to forward his wife if he did not agree to send her akbar would come himself to fetch her For Akbar had been told that she was of great beauty and so perfect that in all the world there was none other like her since there was in the world no other king of greater valor or of greater wealth than Akbar therefore the most beautiful of women was his by right if she was not delivered to him he would harry the whole kingdom with fire and sword in order to accomplish his desire therefore it were very well if the raja agreed to send him the lovely padmavati the raja replied to Akbar that He need not trouble himself to come because rather than give up his wife he would lose a 100000 lives and in case he resolved to come he would encounter a veritable rajput Akbar was angered at this answer believing that there could be none in this world anyone who would dare to resist his demands or risk himself against his valor he began his march to the fortress when he heard of this movement the raja who was called Jamal along with his brother Patta came out against Akbar there followed many encounters in this open plain for Akbar was anxious to demonstrate his bravery his strength and the wealth that he possessed 
and at the same time to prove that he was able to punish those who resisted him. He had taken with him a very large army, against which the brothers were unable to hold their own. They were therefore forced to take shelter in their fortress, where they endured an investment of twelve years. Akbar was astonished at such great persistence, and began to understand that there might be found in the world a fortress which could resist his victorious arms. Seeing that he was able to do nothing against this fortress, he made up his mind to continue his conquests elsewhere and leave this fortress in the hands of its owner, or to speak more correctly, he pretended to do so, in order to acquire by means of treason what he had not been able to take by force of arms. For this end, he sent a ambassador to Raja Jamal, informing him of this intention to depart. Before starting, however, he would like to meet him and give him a feast by way of farewell. His reason was that he wished the pleasure of seeing such a valiant man, and should he not wish to quit the fortress, he, Akbar himself, would go to say farewell if permission was granted. The Raja, who would not venture to come out for fear of some treachery and having no idea of what Akbar was about to do, replied with the greatest openness that should Akbar wish to come into the fortress, he would be welcome. If the fortress had been closed against the great hero, it was only because he had tried to enter it as a conqueror. But when he wanted to enter it in a friendly manner, its gates would be thrown open. The only condition was that Akbar should not enter the fortress with more than 500 people. No offence ought to be taken at this condition, for as a faithful vassal of the Rana, he was under an obligation to take precautions, usual in the time of war. Akbar accepted the proposal. He entered the fortress with his 500 men, where he was well received and great honours were paid to him. The Raja gave him a great feast and laid before him many presents of valuable jewels. Akbar received all this with signs of friendship, and as a return for this good feeling, he gave to the Raja several elephants and horses, also a sword accompanied by a shield, ornamented with valuable stones and other rarities. In the conversation that they had, Akbar greatly praised the Raja's courage and that of his officers, but above all displayed his admiration of the fortress, declaring it to be impregnable. With this talk, he succeeded in gaining the affection of the Raja, and taking his leave, said to him that from that day henceforth, he would always look on him as a friend. With these demonstrations of friendliness and such like talk, Akbar took his leave, the Raja escorting him as far as the gate. When the false friend and great conqueror Akbar found himself there, he raised his hand to his neck and took off a string of pearls of inestimable value, saying to the Raja, I offer you this string of pearls in remembrance of me and as a mark of how much I like you. So saying, he put the necklace around the Raja's neck. Then Akbar embraced the Raja with both arms in such a manner that all of a sudden he dragged him out of the fort gateway. The five hundred men in Akbar's retinue placed their hands on their sports and began to strike out right and left, and men held ready for the purpose ran up and carried off the Raja to the army before his soldiers could come to his assistance. Great was the astonishment and uproar in the fortress. With equal expedition, they closed the gates and stood to arms. They suspected that the enemy by treachery had made himself master of that invincible fortress. All the commanders hastened to their posts. It was only the chief of them all that was wanting, the Raja himself. Not knowing what to decide upon, they carried the sad news to the lovely Padmavati. She bravely replied that they should not lose their accustomed courage, that they must consider the Raja as already dead, and that she had assumed his place in the defence of the stronghold. Thus the treacherous Akbar would not be able to triumph through his deceptions, if they on their side resolved not to falter. Inspiring the officers with fresh courage, she forthwith mounted a horse and seized a lance, and thus equipped, followed by all the officers, she went around giving new orders, saying that not only need they not fear the strength of Akbar, but she was certain and assured in her mind that they were able to resist the armies of the whole world, and she could never lose the fortress while backed by such troops. Akbar imagined that having taken Jamal prisoner, the fortress was already in his hands, and that he was already in enjoyment of Padmavati's beauty. She was also known as Padmini. Therefore he wrote a letter to Padmini requesting her to surrender the stronghold, adding that if she did not make it over to him, he would cut off the head of her beloved Raja Jamal. The courageous woman replied that so far as she was concerned, Raja Jamal was already dead, 
While to take his place, they were within the fort, are the braver and stronger warriors. They counted this as the day on which the siege had commenced, and were determined to fight on while life endured. Never would they yield. Akbar, seeing them so resolute and knowing how stiff-necked the Rajputs are, raised the siege. But he left all the carpets spread in his tents as a sign that he would shortly return, and had not given up hope of taking the place. He marched away and repaired to the town of Fatehpur, which he had founded in remembrance of a great victory won over the Pathans. Here he placed Raja Jaimal in solitary confinement. Meanwhile, he still solicited the famous Padmini with a thousand promises, letters and valuable presents. He sent a message to her that if she would accede to the desires of a renowned king and conqueror, he pledged his word to make her the greatest queen in his palaces. But Padmini would not consent, neither through messages nor presents nor soft words of intermediaries. She remained faithful to her husband. Still, in order to deceive the deceiver, she pretended to have been won by Akbar's love. After much carrying of messages to and fro, she sent word to him that overcome by his persistence, she had made up her mind to join him. There was, however, one condition. Before she appeared in his presence, she wished to say farewell to her husband in order to be absolved from the oath of fidelity that she had given to him. When that was done, she would without hesitation place herself at the king's disposal. King Akbar conceded everything that the lovely Padmini demanded. She set to work to make the necessary preparations for her journey with great pomp and majesty. She prepared a handsome palanquin, well closed up, collected many eunuchs and foot runners to surround it, giving them orders not to allow anyone to come close to it. Then, pretending she had relinquished the fortress into the hands of Patta, she caused the close palanquin to be sent out, accompanied by three thousand Rajput horses, all men of valour, and following it were many other closed palanquins, as if each held a lady of her suite. The start was so conducted that everybody understood Padmini had gone, all except those who had been charged with carrying out this matter, and lamentation arose at the loss of such a princess. When this cavalcade set out, a message was dispatched to Akbar, saying that the princess was now on her way, full of longing to take up her abode with him. But she sent a warning not to forget the promise that he had given to her, to allow her to take leave of her former husband. If the slightest hesitation arose about this promise, she was resolved to kill herself, having brought with her for this purpose a large, well-sharpened dagger. The whole of this story was make-believe, for in the palanquins there was no one, while the horsemen were intended for the rescue of Raja Jamal from the prison. Akbar, who thought that the princess in a letter was speaking the truth, sent to her many times messages with presents of fruits and flowers, displaying his anxiety to behold her for whom he had such ardent longing. On the arrival of the messengers, the clever eunuchs received the gifts, and approaching the palanquin, pretended to deliver the message and receive the reply which they invented themselves and sent back to the king. Once they returned an answer to the king that he must relieve her from such constant gifts, for was she not already assured of his affection and goodwill? The only thing yet to be done was to say goodbye to her husband when she would be at his disposal. So great was the anxiety of Akbar to see the beloved Padmini delivered into his hands that he feared she might take her life with her own hands. Believing that she spoke the truth, he was anxious that nothing should be done to displease her. He sent back word that she might advance in all confidence, that he gave her the liberty of going wherever she pleased. On the day that she was to enter the town, Akbar sent out a lovely litter for her, to ride in after she had said goodbye to her husband. Also a number of palanquins and carriages full of ladies, a great many eunuchs and all the state retinue of a queen. But the men on guard over the princess, having well learned their lesson, allowed no one to draw near to the palanquin. They made straight for the prison where Raja Jamal was kept, taking with them the palanquin, into which they had put two men, to cut off the fetters of the prisoner. On reaching the place, he was freed at once. In a very little time, three men came out of the prison, one being the Raja, who mounted a good horse, kept ready at hand for the purpose. He placed himself in the midst of his Rajputs, who were waiting for him and gave him hearty salutations then, Without delay, spurring their horses, they rode off, leaving behind the empty palanquins and the astonished eunuchs and ladies who had come out 
to escort the princess to Akbar. Akbar was waiting in a garden where he intended to receive the princess. A messenger arrived in the greatest haste to acquaint him with what had happened. On seeing him, the king with a cheerful face asked him if the long-desired Padmini had arrived. The messenger hesitated, not wanting to speak for fear that the king might in a passion order his head to be cut off on hearing a report of the deception practiced and the flight of the Raja Jamal. But upon Akbar repeating the question, he answered that the Raja had fled and recounted the events. Akbar stood amazed at such a report and pressing his head with both hands, said in a loud, heart-rending voice, I am deceived by those I had deceived. Then he gave orders that the Raja should be pursued and seized. But before the order could be carried out, the Raja had gone a long way, there being on the road many changes of horses. In a short space of time, he arrived at the fortress of Chittor, where he was received with great rejoicing by all, more especially by the faithful Padmini, to whom was accorded the praise of being a clever, prudent, an experienced woman, who had known how with such finesse to regain her husband and deceive the man who imagined himself the astutest person in all the world. When the Raja found himself again within his fortress, he sent a letter to Akbar, wherein he, at one and the same time, denounced his treachery and intimated that since women could do so well against him, he had no fear in challenging him to come once more to attack the fortress. Raja Jamal ordered the erection at the highest point in the Chittor fort of a pillar on which were inscribed words to the effect that no faith should ever be placed in the treacherous Mughals. Angered and aggrieved, Akbar marched a second time against the fortress of Chittor, resolved either to lose his life or to take the place. It was invested, and at the cost of much bloodshed, he raised a wall with a tower and fought on for a long time without doing any harm to the fortress although on both the sides many men were killed. It happened one day that Akbar was upon the tower when he saw a man appear in the fortress near the walls to make an inspection. He fired with his gun and killed the man. The following day he heard that the man he had killed was the Raja Jamal, who following the Rajput custom was burned lying in the arms of the renowned Padmini. By this glorious end was taken from the world the most beautiful woman of Hindustan, about whom there had been so many and such prolonged wars. Thus Akbar, with all his tricks, could not achieve his designs, and her death put an end to the vain hopes of the enamoured king. He continued to invest the fortress, and the Rajputs defended it with the same valour as before. Manuchi said, If any of the Mughal kings inherited the valour and judgment of Tamur Lung, it was without contradiction the king Akbar. So Manuchi is comparing Akbar to Timur or Tamur, who had said that my principal object in the invasion of Hindustan is to lead an expedition against the infidels that according to the law of Muhammad we may convert to the true faith the people of that country and purify the land itself from the filth of infidelity and polytheism and that we may overthrow their temples and idols and become Ghazis and Mujahids before God. Emperor of Islam, Emir of the Faithful, Shadow of God on Earth, Abul Fateh Jalaluddin Muhammad Akbar Badshah Ghazi is a most just, most wise and a most God-fearing ruler. This is how Abdul Qadir Badoni described Akbar in Muntakhab al -Tariq. And given that he himself had been appointed Imam by Akbar, it is safe to say that this pompous description was approved by Akbar himself. Akbar Badshah Ghazi. So just because Akbar removed the jizya for political reasons, Yes, political, not humanitarian reasons. And just because he appeared tolerant, again, for political reasons, does not mean that Akbar was some benevolent king. And I'll demonstrate that by telling you one more story. The story of this particular incident involving this Badawni and Akbar gives a great insight into the personality of the Mughal king. In 1576, the Mughal armies were marching against Maharana Pratap. And at that time, Badawni asked for an audience with Akbar. When he met with the king, he begged Akbar for a leave of absence from court duties for, he said, the privilege of joining the campaign to soak his Islamic beard in Hindu infidel blood. Bidani wanted Akbar to give him a leave of absence, a break from his regular imam duties, so he could go and kill some Hindu infidels. Akbar was so pleased at this expression and Badawni's loyalty 
to the Islamic idea of jihad that he bestowed many gold coins on Badawni as a token of his pleasure. Shocking, right? After all, the NCERT textbooks tell us how tolerant and kind and benevolent Akbar was. But in reality, he was a mujahid who lusted for jihad, like every single Islamic invader who ever dared to invade India. From the very start of his career, Akbar had shown no signs of tolerance or magnanimity, instead showing all signs of being a jihadi. I'll once again narrate the story that I've narrated in my other videos before as well. The story of Akbar's battle with Maharaj Hemchandra Vikramaditya. And I quote from the writings of the respected historian R.C. Majumdar. He says, On 5th of November 1556, the two armies met face to face on the historic battlefield of Panibat. The Mughal army, which was positively inferior in number, did not possess more than 25,000 horses. Hemu began the battle with a vehement charge on the Mughal ranks, which threw the wings into confusion. He then directed his attack with all his elephants against the center, commanded by Ali Kuli Khan. In spite of their valiant efforts, the Mughals under Ali Kuli Khan could not stand the onset of Hemu. He was on the point of gaining victory when an arrow struck him in the eye and pierced his brain and he fell unconscious in the saddle. This turned the tide of the battle. Hemu was captured and brought to the presence of Akbar. Bairam Khan begged him to slay Hemu with his own hands in order to gain the reward of jihad and the title of Ghazi. Akbar accordingly stuck Hemu with his sword and Bairam Khan followed him. Akbar beheaded an unconscious half-dead Hemu just so he could be hailed as Ghazi, a warrior of Islam, and gain the reward of jihad, which is Jannat. Do you know who else describes themselves as Ghazis? Members of Taliban, ISIS, Al-Qaeda? Is this the kind of character that can be hailed as great? Can we still call him Akbar the Great? I ask you to think for yourself. Would you call this man great? As R.C. Majumdar further said, the story of Akbar's magnanimity and refusal to kill a fallen foe seems to be a later courtly invention. The humane and liberal emperor of Hindustan, who preached universal toleration, was not born, but made. So, Akbar the Great was not born, but made up, manufactured by the colonized obligations of the Darbari historians. Akbar was a mujahid, a barbarian who indulged in jihad, just like any other member of ISIS or Taliban or Hamas. And there were many such instances where Akbar did everything that a mujahid is expected to do. Like in the Battle of Gara in 1560, where 48,000 Hindus were massacred. And not just soldiers, but regular innocent civilian Hindu men, women and children were brutally murdered. In 1564, Akbar conquered the Konwana kingdom that was ruled by Rajavir Narayan, who was a minor, ruling under the guidance of his mother Rani Durgavati. After her defeat in that battle, Rani Durgavati killed herself. Considering that she was fighting in the battle herself and had no access to a lit funeral pyre to commit Johar, she did the next best thing and stabbed herself to avoid being captured and being used as a sex slave and being forced to live as a concubine in the Mughal harem. Her younger sister, Kamla Devi, however, wasn't so lucky. She was captured by the soldiers of Akbar and sent to the Mughal harem. According to Nizamuddin Ahmed, in the battle for the conquest of Nagarkot, 200 cows belonging to the Hindus had found shelter in a temple. The soldiers of Akbar's army found those cows and slaughtered them. Then they took off their boots, filled them with the blood of the cows and showered it upon the roofs and the walls of the temple. Like many mujahids before them, they also desecrated the temple of the Hindu kafirs. And who can forget the third siege of Chitor, where according to James Todd, Akbar had measured the number of massacred Hindus by weighing their janeu. There were so many Hindus killed that to save time, Akbar decided to measure the number of killed kafirs by collecting all the janeus and weighing them. They weighed over 200 kilos. Is this the Akbar that we are supposed to hail as the Great One? The Mughal king who was a friend of the Hindus? In reality, he was not even a friend of his own people. In 1567, Akbar got the grave. He got the grave of Mir Murtaza Sharifi Shirazi dug up and exhumed his remains from the vicinity. And why did he do that? Because Akbar's chief justice, Sheikh Abdul Nabi, whose mosque still exists at Mathura Road in Delhi, by the way, this Sheikh Abdul Nabi suggested to Akbar 
that Mir Murtaza Sharifi Sharizi's grave was very close to the grave of Amir Khusro and that a heretic should not be allowed to remain buried so close to the grave of a renowned Sunni saint. And why was Mir Murtaza Sharifi Shirazi a heretic? Because he was a Shia, which in the eyes of the Sunni Akbar would have been a great sin. Just like in the eyes of today's Sunni Muslims, a Shia is essentially a Kafir. Shias were at the forefront of the creation of Pakistan, yet today, in Pakistan, you hear the chants of Kafir, Kafir, Shia, Kafir. The Sunni Muslims of Pakistan do not consider the Shia as one of their own. And this is the Akbar that we are told was so religiously tolerant. This guy cannot even tolerate his co-religionists. And we are supposed to think that for some reason, apart from political, he was so tolerant towards the Hindus. This guy whose behavior was no different than the terrorists that are sent over from the Pakistani side. As I've said earlier as well, you can either respect Akbar or you can respect Maharana Pratap, not both. A couple of you messaged me asking me to mention the sources which I'm using to uh, get information for these podcasts and my reels, etc. So, uh, first of all, not many of you seem aware that I also have a website, Indologia.com, I-N-D-O-L-O-G-I-A.com. On that website, I have a list of books that you can read on different topics, different topics that might interest you. So there's already a book list. Please go and consult it. I'm sure you'll find uh, something of interest to read. In this episode, I've consulted the writings of Nicola Manucci. It's a book called Story of the Mogor. It is very easily available. You should be able to get it on archive.org. And I've also consulted R.C. Majumdar's The Mughal Empire. If you are interested in uh, Mughals, it's a very good book to read. Uh, there's also a book by K.S. Lal, which is called The Mughal Harem. It's all about the, well, you know, you can guess from the name what it's all about. Interesting book, nonetheless. And uh, another question that I get from some of you is about Sanskrit. So with regards to this, you have a couple of easy options. The first is uh, Sanskrit Bharti. They're a great uh, institution. They take Sanskrit classes. And I'm not sure if they still do it online. But at least during the pandemic, they had these online classes. And uh, they also do it offline. I know that. Uh, you could enroll with them. They're extremely cheap, very good teachers. And uh, I think if you complete a semester, you will have a very good understanding of the language. And the second option is this book called Sanskrit Swayam Shikshak. You can buy it. I am sure it's available all over the place. And uh, it's also a pretty good book uh, if you want to learn Sanskrit on your own without having to go somewhere else. So these are the two options. If you are interested in learning Sanskrit, I would suggest please give them a try. I'm sure you'll like one of them. I hope you like this episode. If you did, please do give me a follow. Uh, you can also follow me on all the social media platforms. I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, WhatsApp. I'm all over the place. The name is the same, Indologia, I-N-D-O-L-O-G-I-A. Till the next time I see you, Jai Hind, Vande Mataram.